In this lesson, we're going to quickly talk about some of the different features and options that you can get on solenoid valves. The first one is the flow control. And on this one here, it's on, on the top. Usually it is right in the center because it's a pin that's pushing down on the diaphragm so that when the valve opens, it may not be able to open all the way because you've cranked this valve down on there. And we do that for times when there's too much pressure on the valve and it's misting, atomizing the water. We can crank this down and get a larger droplet size. But also, if there's a lot of pressure in the system and the valve is closing really quickly, you may get some water hammer. And you know what that sounds like. It's a chunk, 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 chunk after the, the zone turns off. And that's actually damaging to pipes, right? It can shake things loose. It can uh, damage the innards on valves, your heads, and especially if you're getting it and it's backing up into your house and you're hearing your house pipe shake you definitely want to address that. There's some different uh, pieces that you can get to put on the plumbing and there's some different fixes that you can have but for the irrigation zone the flow control is really a neat thing to have and I mean I don't, I'm not sure if it really even costs any more to get this particular feature on it a dollar or something maybe at most. On this one here it's actually a little tiny little uh, screw over here on the side that you can turn with a little flathead screwdriver and twist that down and do a flow control. So most of them have the ability. I'm not certain if I've seen a whole lot of valves that don't, don't have the flow control option. Now there's also a pressure control option. Okay, You don't really see this a lot on residential or light commercial systems. In fact, I've never seen a pressure control device on a valve out in the field that somebody else has put in. We've done it before in, in particular situations and usually where a pressure control comes into play is if you've got a massive commercial system or a sports field or an agricultural system to where you need a lot of pressure in the main line but there may be sections to where you need that pressure all the way out to the end so you can't control the pressure at the beginning of the system and you have to control the pressure at each individual zone because like I said you may have some uphill climb to get to a section of the irrigation system so it needs a lot of pressure in the main line but you definitely don't want a ton of pressure getting out to the heads. Really you want at the, at the irrigation, um, at the sprinkler head, you probably want somewhere around 25 or 30 PSI minimum up to about 50 or 55 maximum. So a pressure reducing valve can help with that. Like I said, I don't have one, I haven't bought one in years, but now they make them to where there's an additional piece that you can take off the solenoid and put that pressure control piece on there and then scroll screw the solenoid down onto that. So they're a little expensive, not terribly, but it's definitely the right fix for the right situation. So we have an angle configuration. This is a straightforward configuration, the straight configuration. It's got a direction of flow stamped on it, so we know the flow is going in one direction. And for this type of valve, almost always, I think always, the solenoid is on the exhaust end. Not the intake end, but the outlet end. So all, almost, I think every single uh, valve I've ever seen, aside from a jar top that has the solenoid in the middle, always the solenoid is on the, the exit port, on the exit port end. So what we're going to do here is look at a, an angle valve. If this is a straight valve, we have the option of an angle valve. Now an angle valve is actually has a couple PSI less of friction loss inside the body here. Let's look at the table and you can see that for these sizes you actually get a little bit of a little bit more pressure out of this but just because of the way that the water enters the valve and then exits it. But also not only do you uh, not lose a couple of PSI friction loss inside the valve, but if you think like if you're coming up from underneath, and usually these are used from a very deep main line, so if it was a regular straight valve, you would have to come up with an elbow here and then into the valve. 
So not only with this angle valve are you saving a couple of PSI in the valve itself, but you're also saving the friction loss on the elbow that you're eliminating with this configuration. This is an old Nelson valve, by the way. It looks a little different. And, you know, <clears throat> I would have never set this up like this. When I'm installing valves, I always try to leave at least two or three inches between each of the fittings so that if you have to just cut one valve out of a manifold, it's there for you to do. When you start installing these and you're putting it fitting to fitting like this, and this is some weird stuff going in. It had a one inch here, one inch fitting going out into a three quarter, coming out this way into a half inch. But if you're not leaving any space between your fittings, man, you're screwing yourself. You, you, you're putting yourself in a situation. If you have to go back and fix that, you may have to cut the whole area out if you're not leaving yourself enough room to work. Some people, like I mentioned before, use threaded fittings here, but then don't leave themselves enough room to actually unthread the fitting and take the valve off. So think about that. Um, and we're going to talk later about uh, manifold configurations, when to use them and so forth. So we'll cover a little bit more of that stuff there. So that's basically the angle configuration. We have another configuration. Some people call this the H configuration. What this is is, is an atmospheric pressure breaker. Okay, um, excuse me, an atmospheric vacuum breaker. So what this is is a combination between a, a valve and a backflow prevention device. What this is here is just a, a simple valve and when water is moving through this valve it pushes it open and water moves through here. So when the water shuts off the, the solenoid closes the little valve in here pushes down and it opens an air gap up inside of here so that water can't be pushed backwards through or sucked backwards through this particular model. So the what we have to watch out for on this, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this particular model um, later, but you need to mount this at least six inches above the highest outlet. So whatever the highest outlet, be it a, a spigot, a hose bib, or a sprinkler, this needs to be six inches above that in elevation. I've seen, seen these mounted underground which is absolutely ridiculous because this, the second any water gets in that box and this valve shuts off, it's going to suck that water back inside there and you've just cross-contaminated your own drinking water supply. So this is here for systems that don't have a central form of backflow prevention that has backflow prevention in each of the valves. So you can also find these, everything that we've been looking at to now has been plastic bodies and I don't have a brass body here. Very rarely in residential or light commercial are you ever going to use a brass bodied valve. They're a lot more durable. They're for large commercial systems, sports fields, agricultural systems, generally because they can handle more PSI. What we're usually limited to on most PVC systems, most of the components that are made out of plastic on a regular PVC style stuff, it's usually 150 PSI is the upper limit that it's rated for. A brass bodied valve can be rated from anywhere up to 220 to 250 PSI. So it's the, the, the choice to make for those high pressure systems. Um, we've talked about the jar top versus the regular screw down bonnet. And now we're going to go through a lot of different kinds of valves in the upcoming lessons here. So we're going to take apart this one. We're going to take apart basically all of the, the regular models that you're going to see in everyday use. I mean, there's some specialty stuff out there that you may never see, uh, but we're going to cover almost all of the regular types. So, and, and most manufacturers have a version of their regular plastic uh, irrigation valve that's made for reclaimed water and it usually has a purple top on it or some kind of purple designation on it so that you know that you're dealing with a reclaimed water system. Also you can get for some of the larger valves and generally you're not going to find a scrubber valve in a one inch size, maybe not even a one and a quarter, generally one and a half two inch valves and above you can find the scrubbers on them and therefore 
systems that have a lot of particulate matter, maybe sand, maybe stuff that's being pulled up from a, a well pump, or if it's being pulled out of a big lake pump system. There's a, a type of scrubber valve in here that when the valve is working, there's a little piece on the inside of this plunger that's moving up and down and cleaning it while this valve is in operation and it scrubs, that's what's called the scrubber part of it, and it's scrubbing the the sand or whatever debris is in there out of the moving parts and flushing it on out. They're pretty expensive so that may not be something that you spec on just any old system but it, you'll know when it's the right time to use those type of scrubber valves and those kind of high dollar parts. The last little feature I want to talk about is <clears throat> the DC latching solenoids. Normally what we have here is a an AC system, a 24 volt AC system that holds this open. And when this zone is running, when this valve is actuated, it's receiving electricity the entire time because the 24 volts is what's turning this into an electromagnet and holding the plunger up into the solenoid. A DC latching solenoid does it differently. What a DC system is, is a battery operated timer right? If you don't have any AC outlets around or if you've got a, a, a valve, a zone that's way far away, say 300 feet away from the building and you just added it, no way to get wires out to it, a battery operated valve is a great thing to have. But, but how it conserves its battery power, usually has two 9 volt batteries in it, is it just sends one pulse to open it that's why it's called a latching solenoid is it latches open and then it sends another pulse to close it. Latching solenoid so that way it's not uh, consuming the batteries up holding this open the entire time like an AC system does.